Hello everybody, Todd Woodbridge here and we are once again having online chats. This time it's a little bit of a different variation because we are chatting with legends in lockdown and our first guest on this segment is a former Australian Open champion back in 2002 and that is Thomas Johansson. Thomas, thanks for being our first guest in, in this segment. Where do we find you and how is life in lockdown for you? Well, for the moment we are in, uh, in Monaco. Uh, and we've been here since uh, since the lockdown started. Um, it's been quite strict, I have to say. Uh, Monaco is a small place, so um, they have been pretty much closing down the whole country. Uh, police officers in, in each and every corner, making sure that uh, you're staying at home. But it, it's been okay. The weather has been nice. Um, and uh, we've been dealing with um, the kids' homework a lot because the schools are closed. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a challenge, let me put it like that. <laughs> How are you doing with the kids' homework? Are, are you like, you know, there's a, a show here in Australia, Am I Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Are you coping with that? Um, yes, we are. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very tough, you know, for me, because I don't, I don't speak French. Uh, so I can help them with, uh, you know, the English, uh, mathematics, uh, geography, history, and things like that. But the French, I try to stay away. <laughs> and what about the, the tennis aspect of, of things in Monte Carlo? I mean, obviously you're surrounded by uh, France and can you give us some insight about what tennis is looking like in both of those places? Uh, it, it's, we, we haven't been um, allowed to, uh, to, to go outside. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, my, my son and I, we went out outside and it was quite funny because... Uh, it was uh, a friend of mine that played professional football, a Swedish guy, and he was standing on one side of the square playing football <laughs> with, his, uh, with his son, and I played some mini tennis with my son. And it took, I would say, two minutes before the police came and said, um, yeah. you know, we're very sorry, but you have to go back home because it's, you know, you should stay at home and, you know, you're allowed to go outside for a walk, but, but not play any tennis. So... Mm. Uh, to, to answer your question, uh, everything is closed. The Monte Carlo Country Club, for example, is, is closed. And it made me a little bit sad the other day. I, I, I paused it and the courts are, you know, they, they haven't been taken care of. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like it used to, you know, it used to do. So that made me a little bit sad. But you're not allowed to, to play any sport outside. You, you really have to stay at home and you're allowed to go for short walks, you know, like you said before, you can go to the pharmacy, you can go to the supermarket, you can maybe go for a small exercise, but that's it. So it's, pretty, it's tough. And so that becomes quite tough mentally as well, doesn't it? One of, one of the things when I talk about tennis, oh, sorry, lost my earplug. Um, one of the things when we talk about tennis is, um, transition of what you've been able to do as one of the great players of our game and moving in into coaching um and you've had some really good success in your coaching career already um there's the the small period that you had with maria sakari who's, who's continuing to go on with great things but more so um with david goffham How, how's the coaching relationship with him going in a situation in a period of of time like this well, I think it's going, I mean, for me, it's going really, really well. I, I really enjoy working with him. He's a, he's a great guy. He's a, extremely professional in everything he does. Um, so for me, it was a lot of fun because I was coaching him together with his head coach at the time in 2016. <clears throat> so um, I'm very happy to be on board, uh, you know, again. Um, but, you know, during this time, you, you can't do much, to be honest. I mean, we have contact pretty much every day. Uh, he has his daily program that he's, he's doing. Um, and, you know, if we would have been allowed to at least been outside a little bit, it would have been a good time to work on some stuff, you know, maybe change some stuff in, in, his, uh, yeah, in his tennis. Um, but for the moment, we, we, can't, we cannot do that. So we, we're talking, um, uh, like I said, every day. But nobody knows when we're going to be able to even, you know, go outside and hit. So it's really tough for, for all the coaches, I think, uh, to make a good schedule and, you know, be prepared when, when it really starts. 
when we talk about coaching, um, to be successful as a player is one thing, but to actually have the skill to transform it into being a good a good coach as well is is quite difficult. What have been the attributes that you feel that you've been able to do well that's allowed you this success? It's tough to say, but I think I I, um, I learned a lot from each and every player that I've coached. Um, and I think that what's very important as a coach is that you listen. You know, it's, it's very easy as a coach to go in and say, do that, do this, do, you know. Uh, but my strategy is more to listen to my player. And um, because then I, I, I get a good view, uh, you know, what he or she feels on the court and how he or she feels, uh, you know, sees the match. Uh, because from the stand, you know, you know this as, as well as I do, you know, from the stand, you see one view of the match. But as a player, you have a different feeling and a different view. Uh, so for me, it's very important to, to listen. So I, my strategy is, is most of the time to ask a lot of questions. And then after a certain amount of time, then I go in and I, I, you know, I, I tell them what I, what I saw and what I feel. With, with the break, it's obviously, as you mentioned, hard to be able to work on things. So what, what effect does this have um, on, let's say, David's game, but also some of the other players out there? How, how do you see them coming back from it when there is no actual you know, deadline or, or a starting date? It's probably the better way to put it. Well, it's, it's, been, it's been quite interesting because during this time, I've, I've also talked to other uh, athletes and my friends and former athletes, active athletes, and they all say the same, which is interesting. They have lost a little bit of motivation mm -hmm. because they don't have a goal. They don't know what to practice for. Uh, so I think during this time, it's, it's very, very easy to, to go down a little bit mentally. And this is what we have been trying to avoid. You know, we've been trying to, like I said, you know, talk a lot, text a lot, joke a lot, send jokes to each other, you know, and, and also talk a little bit about, uh, you know, if we get the chance to go on the tennis court, what are we going to do? Um, so it's, um, it's been a challenging time, but, um, we are all looking forward to the day that we get the chance to at least go out and play some mini tennis, you know? <laughs> I know you're a bit of a paddle fan. I, I know that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk in the news over these last couple of days um, with Roger putting out there on Twitter, well, maybe this is the time that the two tours could merge because there's so much sort of... Um, need for that in this this type of time what's your view on the atp and the wta coming together um you know can it work will it happen uh maybe the, the pluses and the minuses if it were to happen it's tough to say because i, I was uh, to be deadly honest i got a little bit surprised by his uh, by his comment um but at the same time i think the idea is is not is not bad but if you're going to merge it would be interesting to see the benefits for first of all i mean for for us but also for the women um so i've got a lot of questions uh, on on twitter and and thomas what do you what do you think about you know what roger said what rafa actually said as well but for me i i feel like our tour is doing quite well uh and to merge i would love to see the you know the benefits of us doing that uh, so i really would like to hear more what roger uh, has to say about it and also uh, i mean in the media it also said that uh, gaudensi and the whole atp have been looking at this um, this option and like i said i don't think it's a bad option i just would like to see what the benefits are for from both sides at, at this time it's a it's actually an opportunity to be able to to get those together you've experienced coaching on both both tours what would be the things that hold it back Oof. I, I, it's, it's tough it's tough to say um you know i have to know more about um how atp are working and also wta are working so um, I mean, I was 
like you, like you said, I've been on both tours. I've seen both sides. They're working a little bit differently. Um, uh, also on the court and, you know, off the court. So, but like I said, I, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea, but I, I just think that you have to be very careful and very precise if you're going to merge to see how we're going to grow the sport even more. Right, but let's take it in a, in a slightly different tangent now. When, um, when you came along and won the Australian Open, uh, you'd grown up watching the greats of Swedish tennis, as I did. Uh, early on, obviously, it was Bjorn Borg that changed the game, and then Mats Villander came along. And then you had um, just enormous amount of players from, from Magnus Norman um, more recently. Um, where is Swedish tennis? What has <laughs> happened to it? And what can be done to get more Swedes back to the top of the game? Well, also a tough question, but um, <laughs> what, you know, when, when, I, when I grew up, uh, we had uh, the tennis clubs were working so well. Uh, I had very, very good practice. I had great coaches in my club. Um, and I also had the opportunity to play with uh, professional players in my club, which was quite unique. So during my time, and I think during Magnus Norman and Thomas Enquist and Mats Villander and all, you know, this big era, I think the clubs were the strength in the Swedish tennis. Now, it's a little bit different. Um, and that's also why we have the academies now coming up. I mean, we have the Good to Great Academy with, with Magnus Norman, Niklas Kulti, Michael Tilström. They are doing a really, really good job. Um, and I think that's the big, um, the big hope now in, in Swedish tennis, that the, the academies are, are going to try to, you know, take care of the upcoming uh, players. Because when I, when I played in Australian Open the first time, I qualified and I was the 17th Swede yeah, to qualify that, in the yeah. main draw, which, which is like, it, it's, it's unique. And now we barely have one. Yeah. Um, so times have changed, but I think that we have to, uh, you know, believe in, uh, in the academies now in Sweden. Um, talking about the, the, the you calling for your first Australian Open and then the, the, the dream came true when you end up winning the, the tournament. I mean, give us some reflection about that particular big moment for you. It was a very strange uh, couple of weeks for me um, because I, I came into the, like I said, I came into the tournament. I was feeling very strong physically, but I didn't play my best tennis. And I actually wanted to go back home uh, because I said I, I can't play. It was at, the, at the, that specific year, it was very windy as well. And as soon as it was a lot of wind, I could lose my head quite easy, and you know that because you were helping me for a couple of months. Um, so um, no, I said I said to my coach and my wife, I want to let's go back home. Let's let's focus on the indoor season instead, with no wind, no sun, nothing. Um, but then we were we sat down and we made uh, you know a decision to to work even harder. And um, then the two first matches in the tournament were not great, but I managed to go through. And then after the two first matches, then I played probably my, my best tennis ever. Uh, and especially in the final against Marat was... Uh, uh, the Australian Open, they were nice to me and, and they put some highlights on uh, a week ago or something. So it was a lot of, a lot of fun to see. But I think in the, in the, in the tiebreak in the fourth set was probably my best tennis ever. Yeah, you have a fun little story. I know um, the bosses at... Tennis Australia won't like me bringing it up, but I think it, I think it, the longer it goes away, the, the better it is. And it's a story about nearly not making it to the final. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my coach, um, he actually he was very he was very unorganized in many things in his life, but there were two <laughs> things that he was very organized, and that was golf and tennis, and. Um, he never, he never missed um, like uh, practice, court uh, booking, uh, transportation booking. But that specific day, um, he did. So I was close not to get into the, to the area because I came in a, in a yellow cab uh, to the final. 
Uh, and uh, I remember the security guy at, you know, on site, he said, uh, you know, you're not allowed to go in here. So, but we managed to go not all the way in, but close. Uh, but that, al- that was also good for me because it made me relax a little bit because I was very tight and nervous waking up that day. And um, yeah, you know me, Todd, I'm, I'm normally quite relaxed. Uh, but that day I was tight, but that made me relax even more. Funny enough, you know, because if, if it would have been the wrong guy or girl, it could have been a disaster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. A, it's a great little anecdote to what ended up yeah. being a, a, a fantastic day. Um, a, another <clears throat> career highlight for you, which, and to be perfectly honest, it wasn't one that I expected that you would bring home to the trophy cabinet, and that was a silver medal in doubles with Simon Asplin in Beijing. And um, I, when I look at, at things that are written about you, you often say that that was one of my greatest moments. Yes. But how can you say that, Todd, when you've seen my volley? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't get a chance to work on your volleys till after no, that. No, I'm, you know, I no, can't remember. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was an amazing experience. And especially... Um, <clears throat> um, playing doubles with my one of my best friends, one of my closest friends, Simon Aspelin, and also be able to you know bring home a medal um, because that year in Beijing, Sweden did not do uh, that well. Uh, I think we we got five or six medals. So when we had this marathon game in the semifinal against uh, Lodra Clement, uh, I heard stories. Um, that were told after that on you know at airports uh in the middle of the city like big screen tv <clears throat> it was a lot of people uh, watching so i think we we got a lot of uh, uh you know support and um but unlucky we played a quite uh, solid team in the final and a week ago they actually showed the replay on swiss tv so it was uh, a lot of fun to watch but they were just a little bit too good for us that day. But, um, you know, to bring home a silver medal is, is something uh, that I would never forget. Yeah, totally. I can uh, understand that one perfectly. Let's remind our viewers that uh, you didn't lose to two bad players, Roger Federer and Stan Wawrinka on the day. Yeah, yeah, it was um, um, not easy. Okay, so before I let you go, i um, been asking most people this. Um, in lockdown, what have you been watching? What have you been reading? And have you been learning anything uh, that you can take out of isolation that uh, will be something that you never thought you might have um, picked up or taken up? Well, we, we've had a lot of time now, especially during the, you know, during the break. Uh, but because during the, you know, before Easter, we, we were quite busy with um, uh, helping the kids with the school. So, but during this break, uh, the, during Easter here, um, I've been watching uh, some series on Netflix. I was watching a very good one called uh, Unorthodox, which I really liked. Very interesting. Um, reading, I haven't been done, been doing <clears throat> that much, to be honest. Um, what I've learned from from this uh, from the lockdown is uh, what I appreciate and what I miss um, because. I think a lot of people during this time, they realize if they uh, like or dislike their job, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I really, really miss my job. Uh, And this is something that I've experienced um, during this lockdown. And also, I think you learn to um, value other things that just went missing during the time that you were living uh, like a normal life and and you you learn how to prioritize and uh, like i said value things that for example uh, you know you you really value your time with the family uh, i do but i i'm quite sure that a lot of people they also realize that maybe uh, you know living with this person or uh, you know might be the wrong thing because here you are in especially in monaco you are living quite small and we are four people on 100 square meters uh, and um, so it's, it's not easy but i really i i have really funny enough enjoyed this time 
Well, we've uh, been very privileged to have you on. Um, love all the words that you've just given us because it, it's a true reflection of uh, what life is been in lockdown. And um, as we wrap up, uh, Tompa, as we like to call you in the <laughs> locker room, <laughs> yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been fantastic having you as the first legend in lockdown. And uh, stay safe, mate, and to all of your family. And we look forward to chatting soon. Um, and let's hope it's when tennis is back out on the court. Thanks, Daddy.